it's Lynn Liaz, and I have Joni Stahl with me tonight. Hi, Joni. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Joni, it is unbelievable the things that are going on, and yet so many people are still in the dark about the times in which we're living and how we are so close to the end of life here on this planet as we know it. You know, we're so close to to the coming of Jesus Christ and everything. In fact, you experienced a major earthquake. You live out in California um, just last night. We know there's a, been a major increase in earthquakes. What was it? Um, I can't remember, like a thousand in three weeks, not too long ago. So what was that like? And, and what do you think about all this? Well, I've, I'm a native Californian. I've lived here my whole life and I've, you know, been through a lot of earthquakes, but that was by far the biggest one I've been in. Now we're about 130 miles away from the epicenter of Ridgecrest and we're right on the coast in Southern California. And, but about seven o'clock right around there last night, we were sitting on our couch and I mean, our house, I mean, there was a rumbling, then a shaking. And next thing you know, it's like the house was going back and forth. And then it started to um, slam up and down. And it was like going for like 40 seconds. I found out it was 40 seconds later on the news. I wasn't counting at that time. And I mean, it got to the point where it started to really then, I mean, like shake and slam upside, uh, upside down, up and down. And I thought, this is it. Stuff's going to start crashing. Like I started to really think, okay, this is real. Um, there's going to be some serious damage because it was going on for a really long time. And it was this crazy rolling. Our house, it was like the leaning tower of Pisa. Literally our house was going like this. It was just terrifying. It really was. I don't know how people say they get used to it. I'm a native Californian and you get used to like little rumbles and stuff, but this was no way anybody can be used to that. Yeah, we've even experienced over on the New Madrid fault line an increase in earthquakes suddenly here. And there's just been strange weather happening everywhere, all this rain. There's been things going on in the animal kingdom, insects, just all sorts of crazy stuff that's going on, Joni. And I'm just, I don't know, I'm just feeling this urgency in my spirit that we are just standing right on the edge of some greater things. What do you think? And what what do you foresee happening in the near future? Where do you think we're at, prophetically speaking? What's your what's your feeling that the Lord is just laying on your heart? Well, I mean, I I'm an old old time prophecy student, so I'm not saying I know it all. I'm no expert, but I've been studying it for decades. And the way I see where we're at really is coinciding with the big player. Um, well, when I say big players, I'm looking at like what we're seeing in the Middle East with Russia, you know, the Russian coalition, Russia, Iran, things that are going on in Israel. And, you know, we are really at the end of the church age. We absolutely, truly are. And I mean, like you were talking about the insect kingdom, like everything is dying right now. And this really started, I think, probably about 10 years ago, we started to see die-offs, like mass die-offs. And even from this earthquake, somebody posted something in Facebook and I looked at it and it was like, well, that's pretty interesting. And it says here, uh, somebody posted this. I wasn't ex exaggerating or joking last night. After the earthquake, thousands of bees were vibrating on the floor and dying. This, and he has an expletive. I'm not going to say it, of course, was so crazy to me. And so there's a video of it. I posted it on my Facebook. I don't know if you're friends with me on Facebook. You can check it out. Maybe it's going viral now. So the guy has a video of it and he is absolutely right. Like I'm looking at it right now and there are thousands of these bees. They're not completely dead. And like you can see, they obviously dropped out of the sky because they're like on the floor, on the ground. He's not inside the house, of course, but like on the ground 
dying. And I want to also say this, you know, it's, it's interesting that we pay attention to these die offs because see when the Lord shows us that like, especially in the, in the prophets, right? He gets into the whole, like Isaiah gets into the earthquake. He talks talking about earthquakes. Um, and I have scriptures here. I mean, I can refer to them. I don't know if I'm going to right now tonight, but there are so many things related to earthquakes that are absolutely connected to God. We know that in the end earthquakes are going to be a big, big thing. We see that Jesus, you know, when they said, what is the end? What well, are the let, let, Joni, let's real quick before you go into what you're going to say to them, not to interrupt you, I apologize, but let's no, tell them. I just want to tell them how bad it is in case they don't know. For instance, posted on July 5th of this year by Michael Snyder on End of the American Dream, it says California quake storm. There have been 1,217 earthquakes in the Ridgecrest area within the last 24 hours. There's just all sorts of stuff, but I just want to show people how bad it really is because people say, well, this stuff's been happening for a long time. No, it's escalated. So go ahead, Joni. I just wanted to give people some numbers there. I thought that was important. Yeah, it absolutely is important because what happens is we start to become inoculated from it because we all start getting used to it. I mean, we're all in the same boat here. You know, I mean, we, we start seeing something that's happened 10 or 15 years ago. We'll say 10. And we're at first, we're like, oh my gosh, birds are falling out of the sky all over the world. Um, you know, uh, porpoises by the thousands are beaching themselves. I mean, I can go on and on. And so we look at these and we're like, we start to slowly start saying that very thing, you know, like, well, I mean, that's just been happening for a while. But if people really, really look at the numbers and it's an easy Google search, it's a very easy research. And when you accompany that with the word and prophecy, it is absolutely daunting. You're seeing something happening that God is allowing to happen because I like today we were talking and I pulled up that verse Psalm 102, 26 and it's 25 and 26. Six and it's of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Like a vesture, uh, they shall it says, and it says, they shall wax old, and like a vesture, thou shalt change them. So, what David is prophesying in this psalm is that our planet is not meant in its present condition under the curse to last forever. We understand that Jesus Christ is going to bring about a new heaven and a new earth. And so we understand also too, if you also want to look up Isaiah 24, Isaiah 24 is a powerful chapter that to me stands out among the rest these days because it's so bold and powerful about the end of all these things. And one of the things it says in there, I don't have the exact verse before me, but it says the curse has devoured the earth. So this entire earth is under a curse. The animal kingdom is cursed. The everything, everything is cursed. Okay. So that's why there has to, it has to go through a transformation at the end of the thousand year millennial reign, which of course that goes into, you know, more prophecy talk and stuff. But the point is, is I want to point everybody back to this mass die off. And it's not even just a mass animal die off, Lynn. There are other things that are dying off. Okay. And people do not have any explanation for it. Like for years, there's been a UG 99 wheat rust. Now that has decimated wheat supplies in the biggest wheat berry nations like in Arabia um, and other major uh, wheat producing nations. And not to mention in Australia, if I'm getting this right, it was just several years ago that I read that they have two of the largest grain silos in the world that are responsible for feeding 
40% of the people of the world. And they've been empty now for a long time because of this wheat rust and they can't contain it. And as soon as they started to contain it, like they came up with some kind of a spray and then that wheat rust mutated itself. And now it's blown about by spores and it's going all over the world. I mean, not to mention Fukushima. I mean, some people are like, oh, Fukushima. But the real deal is that that TEPCO plant is still dumping tons of major radioactive waste into the water. That core is still burning down into the ground. They can't even control that. I think a lot of their earth, the earthquakes that they're having, I think, are from that. That's just my own. I'm not saying I read that. I might have read a few things akin to that, but when that core, that reactor, and I read, I read this from a report that as it burns down lower, 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 it's going to go into the water table of Japan and it's going to cause a hypothermic explosion like that of several, I, don't, I think they said like several nuclear bombs. And I was like, wow, that's pretty powerful. Yes, it is. And there's also other things going on too in the spiritual realms, the spiritual attack upon people who are serving the Lord has just been really, really strong just over the last few years. And it seems like it just gets worse and worse it's almost like the devil knows his time is short. So he's just really getting out there trying to destroy people and do whatever he can. But we know that we serve a God who is in control of everything. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to overcome all the obstacles the devil throws in our path. But I'm telling you what, he is just really trying to to just knock people down and take them out. And it's just nuts. It really is. And people don't know the authority that they have in Jesus Christ either through the power of his name. You know, if I do anybody any justice today, they can um, listen. And I hope you guys that are listening are going to really take this to heart because we, we are in really enemy territory. But there is a curse of this earth. We know it. We've read our Bible. We look around us. We see the nations. We know history. But like what Lynn is saying, Lynn, like what you're saying is that we have a malignant, malevolent enemy. And when he gets closer to the end, because that evil spirit, that demon, he's not a demon, that fallen angel, that cherub, he knows, he knows this book better than you and I. He knows what's in it. He believes what's in it. He's not wondering what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen. And what he's trying to do is it's basically he wants to wear out the saints because when he wears us out in daily life and all kinds of stuff exploding in our homes or exploding at work, or maybe everything is coming upon you on all sides I'm not saying everything is a demonic attack, but let me put it to you this way. The closer you begin to draw to the Lord, the more the enemy is going to fight it. But the Lord wants all of us to execute his authority. In the book of Luke chapter 10, Jesus says, behold, and that word behold in the Greek is not like behold, you know, like some like, oh, behold. In the Greek, it's an it's an extreme action of like, look, look, like you're excited. Like, look, I got something I want to tell you. There's there's um, strong emotion in that word. And so he says, behold, I have given you power and authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall in any wise harm you, notwithstanding Rejoice not in the fact that these spirits are made subject unto you, but that your names are found written in the book of life. Now let these sayings go down deep into your ears. Because, see, Satan is the God, the, the unholy spirit who dwells in the world. He's outside of us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. Now, if the enemy 
can get us to live on our outside, meaning always be in our uh, busyness of our soul, our spirit man becomes closed up. In a sense, he becomes imprisoned. And so he doesn't have a way out because the spirit must be a lot, be made alive, which is a born again experience. And then the Holy Spirit comes in, he dwells within us and he begins to mingle with our spirit. So the spirit takes, it's, Jesus says, he will take what is of mine and show it to you. And where does he show that to you? He shows that in your new regenerated self and in the inside. So your soul partakes of what your spirit is receiving from the Holy Spirit. And then your soul is the is to command your body. And that's how the Holy Spirit has his action in the world. So if you're not reading your Bibles, if you're not praying, you have basically pulled the cord on the power source that you will receive in those actions. I'm not talking about works either. Because a lot of people go, well, that's works. You can call it works, but I'm going to do what Jesus did. I'm going to do what the apostles did. And I'm going to say, I'm not, I'm not some big cheese here. Okay. What I'm saying is when you draw near to you, he will draw near to, when you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. But the interesting verse above that, um, it's in, uh, I believe, oh, well, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm talking about our adversary, the devil. Okay, let me go back. When you draw near to God, it says he will draw near to you. Now, the Holy Spirit's living inside of you. So what does that mean? He's drawing near to you. That means his presence comes in. And his presence, Satan can't remain in his presence. And so... When you start to read your word, remember this book is written from it's it's a it's a message from another world. It's from heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord remains for forever. And this whole book is a judgment against Satan. He doesn't want you to read it. The more you read it, more light comes in. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The more you begin to talk to God, the more you pray to him, the more you direct yourself to him, the more you your spirit man comes alive. He quickens you and you begin to operate. Now, now your prayer life, you begin to get strong in your prayer. And I'm going to say this one thing and let you comment. Um, here's how here's a test for you to know that your spirit man is completely withered and bleak and crawling and on life support is when you try to pray, but you can't. You try to say a few words, but it fizzles out. You try to read your word, but it seems closed to you. That's how you know. And I am I guess we'll get into it a little bit more. So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yes. The enemy will do anything and everything to keep you from spending time with God and spending time in his word, even to the point of making you tired. When you sit down and try to read the word of God, you all of a sudden are overcome with this horrible sleepiness or everybody starts to call or text or come to the door. I mean, just anything and everything can happen when you try to take that time out to spend with the Lord. And that is the enemy putting stumbling blocks before you and the people who are calling you or texting, they don't know, you know, what's going on. They have no idea. So my suggestion is unless there's some dire thing that's going on that you have to have your phone on when you take time out to spend it with the Lord, turn your phone sounds off and hopefully nobody will show up at your door. I don't know what I don't put do not disturb on your front door, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, this is a real problem. And there's so many things. In fact, you and I were talking earlier, Joni, about all the things the enemy keeps hidden from us that he does not want us to know because he does not want us to have the power and the Holy Spirit that God has really given to us. He wants us to be just feeble little wimps that are just laying around whining and complaining how defeated we are. That's what the devil wants. 
So you and I were talking and you talked to me about three doors that the Lord showed to you. And I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that in this program, but I just feel uh, that it's pretty important that people know about these three doors that the enemy has hidden and blinded them from that are actually right in front of their face. Yeah, you know, a lot of people who are in their Bibles a lot, or maybe they're not, whatever, but a lot of times um, people are reading their Bibles and they're reading it kind of quick. They're not lingering over it. So um, the more you spend in your Bible, the more the Holy Spirit will begin to to illuminate and vitalize uh, the word. So I was putting together a message for my YouTube teaching channel, uh, Joni Stiles Field Notes, and I was thinking to myself, you know what? I'm going to do spiritual doors. And then I thought, wait a minute. You know how you can, anybody can go on YouTube and type in demonic, satanic, spiritual doors. There's thousands of them. And I really began, the Holy Spirit began to engage me. And he began to show me, and I heard him clearly within my temple, like in my body. I could hear him in my spirit say, Everybody knows it's nothing for people to know about those evil spiritual doors that Satan has, right? Because anybody can go, oh, you opened up a door because now you're, you're, you're drinking, you're sleeping around, you're into pornography. So Satan has us so focused on, yeah, those are demonic spiritual doors. You got to close them. You got to renounce. You got to confess all these things, right? But he said, but Satan does not want you to look at the fact that there are spirit, godly spiritual doors that he is terrified of. And I was like, wow, because in my mind, I have like a book. I'm like, I have like this cross referencing mind and it's like a gift God gave me. I know it's for what I do because I'm an intercessor. I'm a fighter. OK, so you got to have good workability with the word. So I have like pop-up ads in a sense. When I started to see the word door, I was thinking, okay, there's like, there's like really four doors in the New Testament, but the three are the most potent doors and they are this. And I'm going to explain. Number one, there's a door of faith. Number two, there is a door of utterance. Number three, there is only one door in the entire Bible that's called a great door and effectuals. So what I did is I started to go into my favorite commentaries. And so I was reading John Gill, Matthew Henry, a couple of others, and they pretty much all agreed, but they had different ways of wording it. And I really looked up, what does it mean when he, what Paul was in Antioch and I believe it was the book of Acts. I think it was 1427. And he was talking about a door of faith being opened up at Antioch. So Matthew Henry and John Gill said that, see, when we, let me just pause here. See, we American centrize the Bible so much. We're like, okay, so we're just going to pray that God opens a door of faith. And so we, it's not even 3D, it's like 1D. We just think, well, I'm going to go pray for this, talk to this person, cheer them up. I'm going to pray a door of faith opens up. Well, the Greek writers don't see it that way. The Greek writers have that to mean that when God opened up a door of faith, that actually caused power to go out over all of that region. A great power where the Holy Spirit went out and he began to, like in a huge way, um, open up that door of faith so that when the gospel was now being allowed to be preached there through Lydia, that everybody was now open to receive the gospel. But a door of faith had to be prayed over all that city. And let me go next. Now, a door of utterance. I, um, I saw that the door of utterance um, was... In connection with the whole part, it says um, that Paul prayed that a, he said, please pray for us that a door of utterance be opened unto us and that I would that the word of God would be spoken boldly as it ought to be spoken 
and that the word would have free course. So when God, so the commentators were saying that that door of utterance means that he will give you basically a mouth and wisdom that no man will be able to gain, say, nor resist. He'll give you the power to let that gospel come forth. And when I looked up a great door and effectuals, I noticed that one came with many enemies. So I looked up what that word really meant about effectuals because we look at it like, okay, well, that just means the gospel is going to be really effectual. It's going to go out and it's going to affect people. Well, the Greek writers and the commentators say really what that means is the Holy Spirit removes all impediment of your soul. So there's parts of yourself. Have you noticed when you try to maybe share the gospel, a part of you might draw back. You'll beginning to try to share the gospel or share Jesus Christ here and there. And something inside of you somehow, like I'll just say one word, you pull back. Okay. Or maybe other things you can add whatever you want to that, but it's you getting in the way of the Holy spirit. So when you open, ask the Holy spirit to open up a great door and effectuals, he will remove all impediments of your soul. So now the word will come forth without any hindrance and come out full of force. And when I saw that, I said to myself, how was it that I've read this word all these years, decades, but I never saw that until now. So I'm telling you, Lynn, I said, I am going to immediately begin to pray that. And let me tell you the truth. I already told this to you, but I know others, have, of course, have not heard it. I said, I'm going to pray for that. So I started to say, Lord, I ask that you open up a door of faith because I have my ministry. And you open up a door of faith unto those that I'm preaching to and teaching and instructing. And I ask that you open up a door of utterance that I may speak the word with boldness as it ought to be spoken so that your word would have free course and that you would also open unto me a great door and, and affections and those many enemies you will bind and you take care of. And you know what? I'm telling you the absolute truth. I'm not exaggerating it. I felt immediately not that second, like the next day when I went to teach a boldness and a power was coming out of me that I did not have before. It was real. Like I was absolutely amazed. And since I had been doing that seven days a week, I pray that same prayer. And now the force that now the, the gospel is being preached out through me as an earthen vessel with power, because it says in the word, it says in second, Corinthians for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts in the face of Jesus Christ for we are earthen vessels filled with the excellency of the knowledge of God so the power may be of him and not of us Joni I think that's amazing what the Lord revealed to you and it's something that many of us don't know and don't think about and I believe that the battle is going to get worse and worse. And I think this is really important for people to know, you know, it can just open up doors, so to speak, and their spiritual walk with the Lord. And I know myself, I'm not really going to talk about it in this program, but I've been through just the most horrific spiritual battle in the last two years. So I can attest and, and I know that it's going to get worse and I can't imagine it being worse than what it already was for me with the things that I went through. Now, there was another thing that we talked about and I, we were on the subject of earthquakes and there were some things that we had discussed earlier today that you feel the Lord revealed to you in his word about earthquakes that people don't think about. They oftentimes just think about the, um, uh, you talked about Cora or Korah's some- rebellion. Korah's Rebellion. Yes, that was it. 
And I would really like it if you if you feel sure. so moved to share that with the yeah, people I too. Will. You know, we have to remember who created the earth and who it belongs to. And we don't realize that, you know, because we're in this body, in this carnal body, in this world. And so we're like, oh, well, there's an earthquake. And that's because the tectonic plates are moving. Yeah, all these things are real. Absolutely. But we need to focus on who the creator of the earth is. God says he's the creator of heaven and earth, of the skies and of the seas, and even things under the earth. And all the galaxies are his. Remember, he even says he calls all of the stars by their name. He knows everything, right? So I want to talk about Korah's rebellion because that's one thing that was very interesting. Korah's rebellion is in Numbers chapter 16. You could read it yourself, you guys, and the stories, I'll just go pretty quick. Korah was, Korah and his family and there was a huge tribe of them and they were cousins of the Levites. And I believe they were the children of Gershom or Merari. It was one of those brothers, uh, sons of Levi, but they were not called to be uh, Levitical priests. They were given other assignments like, you know, keeping up the tent of meeting whatever it is, everybody had assignments, but not the Levitical priesthood. And so there arose a rebellion. And so they started complaining. They said, Korah said, who are Aaron and Moses that we got to do anything they tell us? Who do they think they are? And they started to come against them really hard. Like we're sick of him. We're sick of him. Moses and Aaron telling us what to do. We don't want them to rule over us. We're Levites. We're really Levites and we're going to do whatever we want. We want to be Levites and we have the right to do it because we're descendants of Levite. And so when Moses heard that, he was, he ran and he prayed and he was like, oh, you know, he was upset because he knew that God would be displeased with that. So he sent a messenger over to Korah's camp and said, Moses wants you and all your men, including the company of Dothan and Abiram that were in on it and get over to the tent because Moses wants to speak to you. And they said, who is he that we need to obey him? When Moses said that, he said, this is it. And he went and he prayed. He got instructions from God. Then he went over to their camp and he said, hear us, hear me. Oh, now. Korah. No, first of all, he said to the people, everybody that is encamped around Korah, leave now. Everybody get away as fast as you can. Because God is about to do something that has never been done or seen before on this earth. And it's going to happen this time tomorrow. So everybody was getting out of there as fast as they can. And that same time in the morning, there was a great earthquake and the earth opened up and swallowed them, their wives, their children, their cattle, their tents, everything they owned went down into the pit and the earth closed itself over them. Very, very serious times in which we're living. And all these things are in the Bible and God's word. The proof is right there. And hmm, I don't know. I just hope that people out there are listening to what's being said here and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and that they will just wake up and get right with the Lord. And I hope that the people out there who are feeling defeated and feeling hopeless, because there's a lot of people out there who just feel hopeless right now. They feel trapped. They feel trapped in sin. They feel trapped in just despair and things that are going on in their lives. I just want those people out there to know that you are not trapped. The devil wants you to think you're trapped. Mm -hmm. There is a way out. And that way out is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ wants to help you. He is there for you. You've just got to give it to him and you've got to put your faith in him and trust in him. And I know personally firsthand 
that can be really hard when you're in the middle of the battle to even begin to understand how to give it to him. I had to have the Lord show me like by example, like I, I was so confused and frustrated. I was like, Lord, what do you mean? Give it to you. And he had to give me an example so that I would comprehend because I, my mind was just so broken. You know, something I want to, I want to say this, you know, people come to me a lot because of my ministry with this very thing, Lynn, you know, they'll say I'm in the middle of it. I've been in it for years. I can't pick myself back up. I don't, like you said, what does it mean? Give it all to God. I've done all I can. I play worship music. I, I, I'm so depressed. I can't even read my Bible. Everybody's telling me to read my Bible. Then people tell me to pray. I feel like I can't even open up my mouth. You know, here's what I tell them. First of all, we have to realize that God is not expecting us to, to build up some froth of, you know what I mean? Doing. Sometimes it's all a person can do to just sit before the Lord. It depends on their depth of pain and woundedness and fear and terror. Or, you know, I mean, it could be all of it at the same time. I want to just say this. I tell, you know, when people go, but I've wasted five years. I've wasted two years. I've wasted all these years. I've, I, I, I've just been away from the Lord. And I tell them, what about right now? What about right now? See, right now is there's power in the now. See, Satan is not, he's terrified of now faith. He is terror. See, Satan is not afraid of any of us saying, you know, I have faith that in a year from now, I'm going to do that and I'm going to go here and I'm going to have that. He doesn't care about that. But he's terrified of the saint that says, no, I believe, though I have nothing that shows that it will ever, ever change. That there be, like Habakkuk, remember he said, he said, though the olive crop fails, though the fields produce no food, though there be no sheep in the pen, nor cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice. I will rejoice in God, my Savior, for he gives me hinds feet to get up upon thine high places. See, there comes a point where when you read the book of Lamentations and you see what Jeremiah was watching, he was watching all the people that he had been warning all the, for all those years that a captivity was coming, but they didn't believe him. And so the terror that he saw depressed him so bad that there was even a, there's a verse and I believe it's Lamentations 4. I think it's, I want to say 50 something, but I'm sorry. And it said, for I, out of the low dungeon, did I cry? And he said, hold not, because he's speaking to God. He said, hold not thy voice at my breathing, neither at my cry. And let me tell you something, Lynn. There was a point of time in my life that I was so broken, I couldn't even pray. And I couldn't, I was just kind of catatonic. Like there was so much trauma in my life. But what brought me out of that pit was when I saw that scripture where God showed me, you see, there's a kind of prayer that goes so deep into your spirit, man, that it goes beyond words. It goes beyond anything into the deepest part of yourself where all you're doing is breathing but God hears that breath and it is a breath of suffering and that arises to God. And I'll tell you, there are scriptures that say, thou gatherest my tears into thy bottle. Are they not written in thy book? And you know, I remember this was years ago. I was in complete destruction in my life. I won't go into what was happening to my life, but I was in complete and total devastation. And I was, I, I couldn't even pray. And I sat down on the ground 
and I brought my Bible with me and I opened it up and I, I was sobbing so bad that I couldn't even see my pages on my Bible. And I, I was just heavily sobbing from my gut. I couldn't even pray. I was trying to pray and all I could do was heavily sob. And I looked down through the, my tears. I know it sounds dramatic, but I did. And I saw that scripture and I heard the Holy Spirit say within me, he said, do you know why I write your tears? I write tears down in a book. I heard him ask me that. And my mind thinks, I don't know, you're, he's counting them. And he said, tears, he, he bypassed my thought. And he said, tears are a language of prayer that comes out of your spirit that is too heavy to speak. See, prayer is a vast economy. It's not, dear Lord Jesus, here I am. I'm, I'm in terrible pain. I'm in suffering. He hears that. Don't get me wrong. He hears you. But I'm talking about, I'm talking to you today, you people out there. If you are in absolute horrible pain, this is for you. You see, every tear that you've been shedding, that they have a language that your voice is too deep for you to give. So all you can do is cry. And sometimes there's people out there who say, Joni, I can't even cry anymore. But I'm like, can you breathe? And they say, that's all I do. When I sit before the Lord, I just breathe. And I said, then breathe before him. Just sit before him and breathe. He knows that you cannot pray. And you see, this is where God becomes their God. This is when God really becomes our God. Not when everything is going our way. We want things to go our way. But God is a savior. He is the savior. He is the redeemer. And he sees every single person right now that says, I'm sitting in darkness. Like David said, he goes, when I sat down in darkness, your light was about me. You, because darkness and light are both alike to you. Think of that verse real quick with what you're yeah. saying uh, that says, be still and know that I am God. So even just being still and knowing that he is God. Okay. And I, I feel led to just share this scripture. Okay, It has to do with what you're talking about with the people out there. Uh, Psalm chapter 40, and it's verses one through three. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. So I remember when I was a little girl, I grew up in the Baptist church and scripture memory we did every week. And I remember that we had to memorize all three of those verses at once. We were going to get a candy cane for it or something. So I had to get my at the time. Yeah, that's how they entice you as a child to memorize these verses. So I remember that one. And, and I'm telling you what, reading the word constantly and getting it in your heart, it does stay with you because mm -hmm. verses will just come out of my heart from nowhere. Yeah, but, because you're alive. Right. But I'm telling you what, that verse just means a lot. And when you were talking, that came to my mind. And I just want to want to tell people out there, you know, it's so, I don't know, like um, almost overwhelming to the mind. And, and wonderful what you explained about the tears and about our breath. And, you know, with the Holy Spirit, when you think of the Holy Spirit, what is it? Ruach, breath. Yeah. And we think about that. So the Lord knows our heart. That's, that's very important to understand. In fact, our heart is shaped in his name. Many of you who follow me already know that, but it's the letter Sheen which is the name of God. And our heart is shaped in the shape of a sheen, which is his name. So that's just awesome to think about literally that God's name is written on our heart. 
So just remember how special you are and that God is with you. And you are not, I know I'm trying to figure out the best way to say it. When I've been through something horrible, it feels like I'm the only one, you know, because it's so personal to you at that time and you feel yeah. really alone. And I just also want to encourage people out there. You're not alone. There's so many of us going through things. And I think one of the hardest parts about going through something painful and real spiritual battles is that at that moment you become so selfish and you realize it because you're so emotionally drained yeah. from what you're going through that you have sisters and brothers sometimes that are going through something and you can't really help them emotionally because you're so, I don't know, you're just so overwhelmed and overcome with this battle you're in. And it's really important to me to want to be able to help other people. So when I was going through stuff, I felt so bad because I felt so selfish. You know, I, I just wasn't, I didn't have the energy mentally or emotionally yeah. to help others. And I think, I think there's other people out there feeling that same way. And maybe you feel guilty for that. Don't feel guilty. And the reason why is because when you are really going through something and it's between you and God and you're having him help you with it and leaning on him, you have to sometimes really get through it. Sometimes you're so emotionally drained. You know, we have adrenal glands in our bodies. We're physically, we're humans <laughs> too, and they yeah. get drained. And then we start getting sick from the stress and we start having symptoms of things. And you just literally can't focus on other people's stress at that moment you can only focus on you. So if you're sitting out there and, and you have that going on, you feel guilty about it. Don't feel guilty. Yeah. You know, just lean on the Lord and rest in his arms. And I'll tell you what, when you do get through it, you can go help all the people you want and you can be a living testimony for it, but get through it and lean on the Lord. Joni, before we end this program, uh, do you have any final thoughts or, or anything you just feel led or move to speak that you want to share with the listeners? I just feel very uh, sensitive that the um, a lot of people are in a place right now where they, in their hearts, are barely hanging on. And they want to, that closeness with Christ. They, they, want a ta they want to taste that victory. And I just feel so strongly to encourage them that God is not expecting you to all of a sudden rise up like some superhero and perform something for him. Um, God is your God and God becomes your God when you're weak because see, I want to talk one last thing I'm going to say, and you can also read about it in second Corinthians chapter 12. And it is to me, Paul learned the secret and to me, it just stands out as an older Christian to me. And I, I call it Paul's secret. And where it starts off where he said, I knew a man above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, caught up into paradise um, and heard words that were unlawful for him to write. He said, and there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, uh, who would buffet me that I would not be exalted like you know become conceited he said not exalted become conceited because of the constant revelations i was getting he said therefore i prayed to the lord three times that he would deliver me from this thorn in the flesh but he answered and said unto me my grace is sufficient for you my strength is made perfect in weakness therefore rather do i he said therefore do i glorify in my weakness for when i am weak then he is strong for when i'm weak the power of god rests upon me and the one last thing i want to say god is not expecting you to do something you do not have the power to do that's satan dogging on you that's satan telling you look at you're not reading your bible look at how you're not pray you you say i praise the lord that the power of God rests upon me for when I am weak, he is strong. And then see now God gets involved. So I want you, the, the listeners. I hope I shouldn't say I want them. I'm hoping 
that the listeners will look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and get that deep into your heart because see, God's going to get the glory out of your, he's going to get the glory. He's not called author and finisher of your faith for nothing. In fact, he said in Philippians 1, 6, he said, being confident of this very thing that he that began a good work in you will be able to, to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, something came to my mind real quick, too, that I want to say before we end the show here as well, while you were talking, when we're going through trials and tribulations, you know, we're in the middle of that dark place. I want you to think about this. How would we know that we need God to begin with? If we never had any suffering in our lives, mm -hmm. we wouldn't. That's we right. wouldn't know if everything was just always wonderful and perfect. Would we even realize that we need God? And we tend to forget about him when things are going perfect. It's when things are not so perfect that we all of a sudden remember God. For many of us, I read a sign on a uh, church one time years ago, and it's always stuck with me. It said, is God your steering wheel or is he your spare tire? Now, on all of us being honest, listening to the show, how many of us can honestly admit within ourselves that it's when the emergencies come and the trials and the tribulations that we all of a sudden cry out, oh God. But then when the finances are great and the health is great and relationships are great and work is great and the car is running fine and everything else, we tend to maybe have a thought or two about God. Thanks for this or that. And overall, you know, we start drifting away. Sometimes our pain and suffering keeps us close to God. Now, I'm not trying to imply that God wants us to suffer. However, let me just plant this seed in your all's mind out there listening. So the important thing is what's more important is your short life on this earth more important or is your eternity more important? Because you see, while God does care about our lives here on this earth, because everything we do here on this earth is going to have an impact impact on where we spend eternity. Okay, so he does care about that. Now think about what I just said. Everything we do here on this earth affects our eternity. Where are we going to spend eternity at? All right. So if some pain and some suffering in this short life that is but a vapor helps you to be able to spend eternity in heaven with the Lord, then was that suffering that you endured worth it? In the end, do you see my point? Our pain and suffering. Let me just give you a tidbit about myself. Before I had all these allergies where I get facial swelling or my face breaks out, which most people say they don't notice, but I do. And that's what's important. And here's why that's important. How do I know that that doesn't keep me in line with God? Because before I had all that, when I was younger, I would go flaunt it. And I would go places half dressed and I would sleep around with men and do all sorts of stuff and go to nightclubs and just dance and show my I acted like a prostitute. OK, I was very I had some very, very sexual strongholds when I was younger. But now because I have this other stuff and I'm not saying I would go do that now. I'm just trying to give an example here. Maybe I would have never stopped doing those things. This was years ago. But maybe my imperfections that I see in myself that others claim they don't see, but I see them. So maybe seeing those in myself keeps me humble to where I don't do those things. I mean, I know that may seem like a silly example to some of you, but maybe it's those things I think of myself that keep me right where I need to be at with the Lord. And otherwise, maybe I would have continued staying out there partying and maybe I'd be dead or raped somewhere or on drugs, who knows. 
I'm just saying sometimes our battles, our struggles, the things we don't like about ourselves, the things we would prefer different are there for a reason. So you never know what God's doing behind the scenes or why. Who can know the mind of God? Just trust in him. And faith isn't getting what you want. Faith is when you don't get what you want. You trust in the Lord regardless. That's what faith is. So Joni, God bless you, sister. I have enjoyed having you on and I hope that you can come on my show more regularly. I think that would be awesome and a yeah. blessing. And just God bless you. And let's just say a quick, if you don't mind leading a quick prayer before we end the show here, that'd be awesome. I'd love, yeah. And I would love to be a regular because I love talking with you and it's just so good. I'm going to go ahead and pray for everybody. Dear Lord Jesus, we just come before you this hour and we thank you. And I want to agree right now with Lynn over every listener that is crying in their bedrooms, maybe crying in their car while they're listening to this. Maybe you're sitting at your desk at work and you feel like you don't even matter in this world anymore or why go on. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, His Father, our Father, is the Father of all comfort. And we ask you, Father, that you comfort. And that's not just something where you lay down and grab a pillow, but there is a power of comfort. It is a peace of God that passes all understanding we pray i pray right now over every listener lord that you begin to make the clouds above them grow thin and let them see your blue skies above them let your light begin to break through all the darkness in their lives you are the God who has, you said there's ones that are out there called prisoners of hope. I ask that you open a door of hope to those prisoners of hope. That you begin to re reveal your great power to them and do things for them that they cannot do for themselves. I ask you to pour it out, to pour out your grace, the same grace that you gave to your servant, Paul the Apostle, and that you cause them to stand upright and to be strengthened and to be full of your Holy Spirit and that you deliver them, even those that are are in the darkness and cannot see any light because it says in your word in closing in Isaiah 50 10 I may not say it right but you can remember to read it for yourself it says when I walk in darkness and I have no light he that walketh in darkness that's how it goes he that walketh in darkness and that hath no light let him trust in the Lord. For when you trust in the Lord, the Lord rewards that. It honors him. And it is as simple as looking upwards where he says, look unto me and be ye saved. So look up to the Lord. And you don't even have to say a word. He already knows. So we pray right now that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. For his name's sake, Jesus' name, amen. 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 
Joni, that was a wonderful, wonderful prayer. And I could just feel the Lord and that prayer. I feel like people are out there being blessed by it and touched. And just thank you for that. And those of you listening, Joni and I are talking about doing some more shows together and about her uh, writing and posting on freedomnationnews.com. By the way, that's another thing. Because of the disgusting, horrendous censorship taking place here on YouTube to where people are getting unsubscribed from my channel and or not receiving my updates, I would like for you to head over to freedomnationnews.com. That link will be posted beneath this video and on the screen. You click on any article and over on the right hand side, scroll down, you'll see subscribe, fill it out and subscribe. If you're using a phone, you have to scroll to the bottom of the article. That's how you do that. So go there and subscribe to ensure that you get an update when I post a video because I'm two videos behind now, so I have to go do it. But that way, when I post a video, I'll post it there. You get the update. Also, if you feel led or moved, please do not give to me because you feel guilted into it. If the Lord moves you to give a financial gift via PayPal or I have a P.O. box, pray about it. You can do that. I'm mostly viewer supported. And that's how I'm able to continue doing this as much as I do because of that. So you're uh, if you feel moved to sow into the Lindley Oz ministry so I can continue bringing you the truth, that would be awesome. Joni, do you want to give them? We never gave them your website. So when I edit this video, oh. I'm going to put it on the screen. What is your website where they can oh, okay. watch you? Well, they can also, first of all, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Joni Stahl's Field Notes. Um, you guys check it out. Uh, I do weekly teachings three days a week, um, straight from the Bible. Um, also, check out my website, and it's very easy. It's JoniStahl.com. Thank you so much, and I apologize. I should have said something at the beginning of the show, but we had so okay. many. We tried. <laughs> those of you out there watching, we tried to live stream this, as many of you might already know. We couldn't get it to work. I've got somebody I'm going to talk to tomorrow about that who messaged me. All right. Well, God bless all of you out there. Take care and make sure you're subscribed and you click the little bell next to the subscribe button. God bless you. Thanks again, Joni. You're welcome. Take care.